They say the classics never go out of style. That's why when a toy concept works, you stick to it and you reuse it over and over again. But what about the toys that got cancelled over and over again, from unproduced dinosaurs to action hero toy gimmicks? In today's Ed's Retro Geek Out, we take a look at a couple of unproduced toys that then catched a rebound to be produced. If you're into 80s and 90s toy videos, then please subscribe to the channel for weekly videos and let's drop in for some toy history. Was there ever a time that dinosaurs weren't cool toys? Let's face it, they never really died out. In the 90s, amplified by the success of Jurassic Park, a dino boom hit toy retailers, capturing the imagination of the whole planet, making popular toy line crossovers a lucrative decision. And to this day, every flea market dino bin I bump into, I dig through, inspecting every toy for either an Imperial marking or the JP logo. Kenner had some really great licensed Jurassic Park dinosaur toys, setting themselves apart by the JP marking on the legs, the dinosaur reel feel, and the dino damage action feature. There's also a ton of dino varieties to pick from, so the toy line could easily go on endlessly. We're gonna make a fortune. Or at least they thought so. Much more cost effective was repainting the same molds or adding accessories, and by the time the Lost World toy line had its first giant run, it felt like time for something new. So they released the Chaos Effect line, mostly consisting of Lost World repaints and adding a couple new sculpts which would need some explanation. Well in the Chaos Effect storyline, the formula that created the Jurassic Park dinos got lost, so InGen decided to crossbreed the existing dinosaurs and mix those genes with the modern day beasts. That's, that's famous there. So InGen never tried mixing it with a frog, cause then you get Bingo! Dino DNA! The result was ultra-ferocious hybrid dinosaurs, the most aggressive predators ever wreaking chaos on an unsuspecting world. And that's how we got these mutated dinosaurs like Tyrannonopus or Tanaconda. However, a whole selection of dinosaurs remained unproduced, as the toy's first wave didn't really catch on. Like the Deinone Canis, Eplocephalus, or the Pachosaurolopus. They even had plans for a second subset of these dinosaurs, vehicles, and action figures ready to go, featuring featuring a glow-in-the-dark feature. This one would have been called the Night Hunter series, and could have given some unreleased dinosaurs a second chance to get to the shelves, but Hasbro pulled the plug on a subline. Glow-in-the-dark usually indicates the end of a toy line, so around 2000 they moved on with the JP Dinosaurs toy line, which were only repaints exclusively sold at Walmart or Universal Studios theme parks. The Ultimasaurus, however, was supposed to have been the big star of the Chaos line, and was also set up for a repaint in the Night Hunter series, but never came to fruition during the 90s. A big dino toy with movable limbs, a dino damage removable wound, and that real feel skin. 14 inches long and 7 inches high, a horrific looking genetic mix between a T-Rex, Triceratops, Velociraptor, Stego, Ankylo, Kentrosaurus, and so on. So, Jurassic World's plot borrowed a bit of chaos for Indominus Rex, it seems. But it got scrapped! Many think this is due to the long horns a previous Triceratops from the second series was also not produced because the horns could have been an eye poking hazard. Now there's rumors of a dozen of these prototypes that have escaped the Kenner's compound and have been going around and popping up on eBay every once in a while. In the end, any extinct unproduced Jurassic Park dinosaur is a true holy grail for Jurassic Park collectors. And if we're talking holy grails, then we best go to the original Tomb Raider. Indiana Jones. A movie series created by Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, but somehow, when the movie came out, they still hadn't gotten a toy license in order. It would take over a year after the movie's release to see Dr. Jones and friends on the shelves. Kenner, who had turned Lucas' Star Wars creations into toys that captured many generations' imaginations, brought Indiana Jones from the screen to your toy chest. With the adventures of Indiana Jones featuring some of the characters out of Raiders of the Lost Ark. The line suffered problems from the start, however, with not enough Indiana Jones or Marion's being produced. When the second movie, Temple of Doom, came around, Kenner opted out
out of their contract and LGN stepped in making the leap to six inch figures, which meant they weren't compatible with the Kenner three quarter inch line. Even though they announced five figures, only three of them made it into production due to scarce orders from retailers. Now these LGN Temple of Dune figures from 1984 got the same Battlematic feature as the Thundercats toy line. Push a magic button on the back and watch these figures move with realistic action motions. Frankie, the main love interest in the second movie, was never made and her appearance in the toy catalog also doesn't show any accessories or provide any more information. A second unproduced toy was Short Round in the sidekick who would have come with a bag accessory. Cause that's what kids want, a toy kit with a bag to play with. The Kenner's line had multiple playsets, so LJN set out to create the impossible minecart playset that came with an indie and short round permanently fixed within the minecart but the arms could still move. The set used a special middle rail flexible track to keep the cart from falling off while going through the loops. Bring home the excitement of the climactic, action-packed mining chase scene from the movie. Watch as the mining car goes sideways and upside down over the flexible track. In the set you got one six feet long flexible rail track, a stunt platform, the cart with the two figures, and two exit ramps, connectors, and joiners to keep it all together. Not really the play set I would have had in mind, it seems more like a Hot Wheels loop track. Some prototype figures have been spotted, but it still seems harder to find a vintage Indiana Jones figure. That belongs in a museum! Unlike finding a crocodile in a swamp. Now why would I say that? The Swamp Thing had been around since the early 70s when it started popping up in comics and later getting its own series published by DC Comics. After movies in the 80s, the character had the look and what it took to be part of the environmental superhero boom of the early 90s. So we got our video games and toys based on the cartoon adaptation of the comic. Swamp Thing is a human-like creature covered with vegetation who fights to protect his swamp home, the environment and humanity from various supernatural threats and has the occasional run-in with the mad doctor Antone Arcane. He also tries to turn himself back to his human form, after all he did end up being transformed as a result from the chemicals released in a lab explosion. So you definitely had enough toyetic features and a leading role that could mutate into multiple toy variations. After all, Kenner had already made the Swamp Thing mold for the last wave of the DC Superpowers line which got cancelled, so most work was already done sculpt wise for the main character. They released Wave 1 and in 1992 a second wave was Land, consisting of nine figures of which four were cancelled before production. Clearly the cartoon show wasn't enough of a success to get the figures to the toy stores and even when they were there they weren't being sold enough to strike up new orders. So we missed out on an all new Defiolator Arcane figure. Arcane is back and he's looking to destroy the swamp. In his protective suit Arcane is the only one that's safe from his chemical liquid spraying backpack. Nice how they always fit a water squirt feature into these toy lines. Constricting Swamp Thing puts a squeeze on villains by constricting them against his body. When rotating the arm, he can reel in the midsection and capture Unmen. And Arcane also got some help in the second wave. We got Scorcher, who never appeared in the cartoon and was kind of a kid bash of multiple Robocop Ultra Police toys, also made by Kenner. This eco villain is just a hunk of burning mutant. He sprays flames to burn down the swamp and comes with a spring loaded claw missile. The alligator swamp thing is the ultimate chameleon, as he can take on the shape of any plant or animal in and around the swamp. He transforms into an alligator with spring-loaded jaws for capturing unmen. It's too bad that this toy engineering concept didn't get released, but many years later it got retooled and used in the G.I. Joe toy line. Or at least it was set out to be released with the G.I. Joe Manimals. Announced in the 1994 Toy Fair catalog were the G.I. Joe Manimals, alien bounty hunters that stalk the stars. From a distant universe come these radical reptile aliens. Each figure features his own mutating body change action. Kits convert them from normal aliens to the meanest mutated monsters this side of the Milky Way. These weren't 
Joes we were used to from the 80s, but more like the mutated monsters we had already seen in the Star Brigade subline. And the Manimals would have been their own series within the Star Brigade group. Feature-wise, they look more like a Transformer or a Mighty Morphin Power Ranger Automorpher, but one of the prototypes looks a lot more like the Alligator Swamp Thing. One Manimals prototype has surfaced and doesn't really fit the description we just read before. It actually featured a humanoid that could turn into a beast-like creature. He hints to having a mutation going on as his skin has reptilian spots and his head also shows reptile eyes. And once again, this is a kid-bashed concept based on a figure called Headhunter, the Vandal's leader from the Robocop line by Kenner. Now how did Hasbro end up in the Kenner archives? It's quite simple, Kenner Parker was acquired by Tom in 87, who turned Kenner into a division, so when Hasbro purchased Tonka, including the Kenner division in 1991, they also owned the Kenner division and the Cincinnati offices and archives were available to get creative with. Back to 1994. If all had gone well, we would have seen six of these Manimal monsters hit the toy shelves at the end of 1994, but the same year also marked the end of the G.I. Joe A Real American Hero toy line. A shame as these were chock full of gimmicky goodness and toy engineering. The toys had already progressed to the production stage, so there's approximately 75 advanced production samples that survived the destructive testing used to determine if Hasbro standards were being met. And the production samples are out there, people. Go and find them. The lineup consisted of Warwolf, mutating body change action. Just push the head back and flip up the chest to reveal the abundance of alligator teeth. Then you had Iguanas, the crocodile type we knew from Swamp Thing, and also joining us is Slitter, who unveils a snake as you tilt back the head and a serpent head on three hinges unfurls. Now Vortex and Spasma have their helmet or entire upper torso opening up to reveal the alien and predator-like beings inside. Vortex is the only one that didn't really pass the testing phases, perhaps all of those panels broke off too easily. Spasma had a button on the back, first opening the helmet, and when you press the button again, it could spray water. Then lastly, zigzag. You could zigzag around by pushing the head down and then repositioning the limbs. And all of the toys came with a big space gun. Now it's a shame that these manimal toys would remain unproduced until the subline was brought back in 2001. Brought back to life and produced exclusively for KB Toys, with a first wave including Iguanas, Warwolf, and Slitter. All of them had been recolored and came with the original packaging art from the 90s. However, the reintroduction of the line wasn't successful enough for the second wave, so the remaining three are still unproduced Joes. Luckily, most of the prototypes have been found and are on virtual display for your viewing pleasure on 3djoes.com. Um, definitely worth a visit if you're a G.I. Joe's fan. Now if there's any of these unproduced toys that you would have definitely grabbed if they had made it to the toy stores, please let me know and leave them down in the comments below. If you'd like to see more videos on 80s and 90s toys, then you can subscribe for free to the channel and also hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new uploads. Remember to like the video and if you'd like to support the channel even more, you can always check out my Patreon page. A big shout out to all my Patreons and you for watching this video. I really hope to see you in the next one. Bye.